I grew up in Long Beach, California, and in fifth and sixth grade, the Long Beach Unified School District had what they called religious education, meaning it was release time for the students. So you didn't attend classes, but you could choose from different churches and spend two weeks of either fifth or sixth grade attending those classes. So uh, the first year, fifth grade, I received the note that about these religious education classes, only to find that I could attend a Catholic church, a Jewish uh, synagogue, or a non-denominational church. Uh, I took the note home to my father. He had been a bishop in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not seeing our church as an option, he told me I couldn't go. But uh, for the school district to get the proper count of students, I needed to still then attend class. So try and imagine two weeks how boring school can be when you're the only person in the class. I mean, recess, lunch, left something to be desired. So as a result, by the time I'm hitting sixth grade, I've been working on my father and uh, saying to him again and again, now can I attend religious education? Finally, uh, when the note did come this time, I actually fasted, hoping that our church would be mentioned. But it was not. It was on the same mammograph note as before. And uh, my father took a pretty adamant stance. And I then uh, started to cry. I had no idea the powers uh, of tears. But at this moment, it, it actually worked. He said I could go to the non-denominational church. Well, it was the first time that I'd ever been to a church that wasn't ours. My father, to try and make sure that my testimony would stay intact, he indicated that I had to wear my primary bandolo every day and to carry a large size Book of Mormon. And I can only assume he thought I would have the full armor of God on and off I'd go. Well, my first day at the religious education turned out to be my last day. As the preacher walked into the church, I was pretty awestruck as I saw his uh, white collar, which means he's looking to God to live, and the black robe uh, meant uh, the depravity of man. There was a beautiful woman singing. There were candles and stained glass windows. I mean, a lot more art than you typically see in our Spartan churches. But uh, anyway, he started to talk, and his topic was the nature of God. And he said God was so large that he could fill space. In my mind, I saw this God. I knew he had a body and that he was just expanding to fill a cloud. And uh, I raised my hand. And I can only assume that I was too small. He just didn't notice me. And finally, he said, uh, God's also in a flower. And I saw him just shrinking, shrinking, trying to fit in. And finally, I'm still raising my hand, and finally when he said, God is in a raindrop, in my mind's eye, I was back in my home, my uh, small window panes, and I was saying to myself, there he is, no, no, here he comes, no, there, there he goes. And uh, finally, I could stand it no longer, and I stood up and I shouted, stop. Well, he stopped. All the kids that had been passing notes, talking, everybody stopped, and the preacher leaned down over the pulpit and he said, what's wrong, little girl? And um, perhaps if he'd been my teacher, he would have known, just roll with it and keep on going. But he asked, what's wrong? And I said, what you just said is not true. And he said, well, what's not true? And I said, um, I, I don't think that God dwells in a, in a cloud, in a flower, or a raindrop. And he said, well, what do you think God looks like? And I said, well, he has a body. And he said, how do you know that? I quickly looked down at my primary bandolo to see how, how did I really know this? And I saw a lark and a seagull and a plastic um, Salt Lake temple, all these different things and rhinestones. But it wasn't there. And so I lifted up my large size Book of Mormon and said, it says so in here. And uh, he, could, he could see the print, all right. And he said, oh, that. 
He then invited my friends to go off to their workshop classes, and he said to me he wanted to see me in his office. Well, as I uh, walked into his office, he was interested in the Bandolo, all right, and I repeated some of the 13 Articles of Faith as to why I had all of these kind of trinkets on the Bandolo, but he was much more interested in the Book of Mormon. And he says, uh, where in that Book of Mormon does it say God has a body? And for the first time in my life, I opened up the Book of Mormon. And I was disappointed to find such words as Zarahemla, <laughs> and uh, there's Moroni, and uh, well, I couldn't find it. He then said, could it be, young lady, you've never read that book? He and then invited me to go back to the school and to sit with a new teacher who seemed to carve her fingernails every day and to read the Book of Mormon. That then became the first time I, I read the Book of Mormon, and I'm not going to say I was like Parley P. Pratt, you know, where he goes, you know, he couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, he wants to stay up all the time and read the book. That's not how it was for me. It was a pretty tough go, but I never found my answer. Years came and went, and I kind of touched the Book of Mormon, but uh, I was a pupil, never really a student. But then I come to the 1970s, a time before there was computers, at least for the average person, even an average professor. I was uh, teaching Book of Mormon, and um, I had read everything the scholars had written about the Book of Mormon, and one day I'm passing Robert J. Matthews, a colleague in the hall, and, and uh, we were talking about the Book of Mormon, and he said, how are you doing with your class? And I said, well, come on in. I've, I've actually made a list of all of the books I've read about the Book of Mormon. And he sat down, he looked over the list, and I go, what do you think's missing? And he said to me, well, it looks to me like you've never read the Book of Mormon. He goes, I can see what everybody else was saying, but where's the Book of Mormon on this list? And I said, well, I've read it. And he said, well, have you found all your answers in it? And I said, well, you know, since I've been a kid, I was, I've been looking for an answer. I wanted to know more about my Father in Heaven and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. And he goes, well, well, then read the Book of Mormon. I go, well, are you talking Third Nephi? You want me to memorize Third Nephi? Start with Third Nephi 11? And he goes, no. He goes, I, I, I want you to read the Book of Mormon and find uh, Christ on every page. Well, that, that started an amazing study. I think even though I'd been teaching the Book of Mormon, I had been a pupil. I'd never kind of uh, ripped it apart, <laughs> underlined, pulled it together. Uh, and uh, well, when I finish the study, I'm sitting by a woman at church, and she looks over as I open a page in the Book of Mormon, and she said, uh, what do you think the Lord's going to think about how you graffitied his book? And uh, I then said, I think he loves me because I took the time to do it. So what did I find out? And what I found out changed my life and actually some of my friends and some people that, I, that I, I've never met. But I decided to do uh, something pretty simple. So we know the Book of Mormon. We, we know there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament and now there's another testament of Jesus Christ. And so the subtitle tells me I'm going to learn about Christ. And as I open up the Book of Mormon and I read the title page, even Moroni says that the purpose of this Book of Mormon, at least one, is to convince a Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. But then I look at the table of contents and I see Nephi, Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Omni, Jerem, and pretty soon I'll be singing. But, uh, you know, I, I see all these uh, titles, but I don't see Christ. And so then I decided that I would do something I'd never done before, but I would take a pen, I'd open up my Book of Mormon, and then I would underline 
every time I saw the name of Christ, and then I would pause and ask myself what I'd learned. So for example, I'm going to start with 1 Nephi 1.1. I think actually it's the most read verse of the entire Book of Mormon. I mean, how many times do I say I'm going to start reading the Book of Mormon again and always start with 1 Nephi 1.1? What I found out was that basically every verse in the Book of Mormon is one sentence. And mind you, they look like run-on sentences. You've got semicolons, colons, commas, commas, you know, one phrase after another, but there's only a handful, and that might be a challenge for some of our listeners, to find the verses in the Book of Mormon that are actually two sentences. But every verse, then looking at it one sentence, I'm looking to see if I can find about uh, Jesus Christ. So I start out 1 Nephi 1.1. 1, 1. So <clears throat> I start out, I Nephi, and then you get the first part, having been born of goodly parents. And how many times do we hear that in testimony meetings? Someone says, hey, me too. And uh, the question is, what does goodly mean? Does it mean that Lehi um, was a prophet? Well, surely. Does it mean that? Does it mean that he had lands of uh, lands of inheritance, a uh, place in Jerusalem? And you're like, yeah, maybe it could be viewed as monetary. But the question then you ask, did I learn anything about Christ in that phrase? And I, I'd have to be honest and say no. The second phrase is, therefore. I was taught somewhat in the learning of my father. We know from the naming of the children of Lehi that he obviously knew Hebrew, he knew Arabic, he knew Egyptian from the names of his six sons. I'd then pause and say, did I learn anything about Christ? And I'd say, no. The next part, having seen many afflictions in the course of my days. Having read the Book of Mormon many times, I could say, well, truly, Nephi and his brothers, there are some pretty serious afflictions going on, let alone Laban and his, you know, 50 and whatever. Okay. But then uh, I come to something pretty interesting. It says, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord, I underline the word Lord, and I go, Nephi was highly favored. What would you like better in your life? <laughs> to be highly favored of the Lord. And then I wondered, who's the most highly favored of the Lord today? Well, obviously, it's living prophet. But what does it mean to be highly favored of the Lord? So I learned something. The Lord has favorites. You know, in school, I knew people that were teachers' pets. Wow, they had all the privileges in the world. So I now learned something pretty interesting in verse 1. The Lord has favorites, and then it goes on to describe what a favorite is says, Yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and mysteries of God. What I learned from this is the Lord has favorites. The favorite is Nephi. And Nephi knows how does he know he's a favorite because he understands the mysteries and goodness of God. Then he says, Therefore, I make a record of my proceedings in my days. Notice it's all one sentence. But you'd say, Why does Nephi make a record it's because he knows the mysteries and goodness of God. So now I want to put forth a thesis. The thesis is, the Book of Mormon is a story within a story. The pupil, like me, at one point in my life, I found one story. The story was about civilizations that fall. Nephites fall, Jaredites fall, um, Lamanites fall, Everybody falls. And um, so you'd say, I, I found that story. That story's about broken bows. It's about getting to the promised land. It's about 344 days, you know, on the ocean waters. I mean, that, that's, your, that's your story. The story within the story is the mysteries and goodness of God that tell us about Jesus Christ. I decided to unlock that story. And to unlock the story, I did something so simple. I mean, we can all do it. You know, check me out. Try it on your own. <laughs> you just take a pencil, a marker, whatever you want. Just underline the name of Christ wherever it appears. What you're going to find is that his name appears 
more often in uh, chapters that don't deal with war. And that makes sense to me. Um, you'll find that, uh, so Moroni, filled with the name of Christ. But what you'll find is you can't read uh, 1.7 verses. In other words, you can't read on average two verses without seeing the name of Christ. So for those that, uh, you know, young missionaries saying, hey, I, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ, and then they have the potential convert turn to 3rd Nephi 11, and, uh, you know, can you see the convert saying, I don't really like history. Why would I want to read the history of something in the Americas when I live in Japan, I live in Saudi Arabia, I live somewhere else? But you'd say, no, no, you, you can open to 1st Nephi 1.1 and learn about Christ. And then every 1.7 verses, you're going to find him. Now, as I went through, uh, for the first time, um, I'm reading the Book of Mormon. Not only do I not feel sleepy, I'm setting the alarm in the middle of the night so I can keep going. You know, and uh, what am I finding? I'm not only finding that his name appears every 1.7 verses, but that he is known by many different names. He is known by 101 different names. Now, I've been writing books for years. Um, I have never been able to call one of my characters 101 different names. And, uh, and the interesting thing of the 101 different names, there isn't a negative name in there. I can think of myself, I mean, just while driving a car, you can't imagine what I've been called. <laughs> but, but, you know, people could look at me and they'd say, teacher, mom, you know, she's something. But you would, you would struggle to come up with 101 different names. So now I wanted to test Joseph Smith. He, he's on his first book. And, uh, you know, I've now passed 100. So uh, he, he's a kid. He's in his 20s. And... Uh, I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to take each one of those 101 names, take them out of context of the Book of Mormon, define them according to other scriptures, New Testament, Old Testament, uh, uh, define them according to prophets. You know, what do they use it? What does it mean? In other words, the word creator, one of the 101, it has to do everything with the creation of the earth. Um, Lord God omnipotent has to do with power. God of Abraham has to do with the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Lord God of hosts, uh, the Lord will fight uh, for his people. He will defend his people. Uh, Jehovah has to do with Old Testament times. Um, you know, it's, uh, he's the Lord, he's the God. Messiah typically has to do with second coming. Uh, the great I am, you know, Lord of the vineyard, I'm finding all of these 101 different names. I then uh, took them, I defined each name, and put it back in its context to see, okay, Joseph, you're going pretty fast. You got Oliver Cowdery as a scribe. Here comes, you know, about 11 others coming in occasionally to be a scribe. You know, as, as you're doing this pretty fast, and you're basically, it seems like he's on a time frame. Uh, could he have made such a simple mistake of saying God of Abraham, when it would have been much more appropriate to say God of Israel or God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Did he say creator when he should have said um, Lamb of God, meaning he's about to be sacrificed? Did he say Redeemer, Savior, when it would have been much more appropriate because it was obviously talking about the second coming to say Messiah? So I had uh, the biggest gestalt, the biggest learning experience that I probably ever had in all the years of haunting libraries from coast to coast. And it is, uh, there's no mistake. 101 different names. And you realize if, if I were to write and put the person's proper name, uh, it appeared before I had written two sentences, the editor would say, have you ever heard of he, him, his? <laughs> Come on, try a pronoun. Uh, but you'd say, for Joseph Smith, how, how could he possibly have done that unless he was what he said he was? He was a translator. 
that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. It is another testament of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you get a testi testimony of the Book of Mormon, with it will come the testimony of Joseph Smith. They, they go hand in hand. If you get a testimony of the greatness of Christ in the Book of Mormon, with it will go hand in hand a testimony that Joseph Smith was a translator. Now, as I finished that, I decided I, I need to find out that answer for the preacher that has bothered me all those years about what is the nature of God. Joseph Smith had said the nature of God uh, was the most important thing that we on earth could learn. And so I went through the Book of Mormon. I finally concluded, amazing testimony of Christ, but now tell me about his nature. What's, what are his characteristics? What makes him happy? What makes him sad? Does he be, experience wrath? Does he experience fiery indignation? Well, I found something pretty amazing. The Book of Mormon is filled with the nature of God. And uh, what I found that was probably exciting for me, as someone that doesn't necessarily live a perfect life, that uh, on a two-to-one basis, the Lord is much more merciful in the Book of Mormon than he is judgmental, even though he's dealing with civilizations that fall. So um, I found the following things. I found about his nature. The Book of Mormon talks about he is a being. And, um, with, uh, and it then t goes through his parts. His bowels are filled with compassions. With his hands he lifts. With his eyes he sees. With his feet he you know, he's able to move, and uh, it's, it's much like us. But I did find an exception. So I, I wondered, you know, in the next life, I, there I am, the judgment bar, Moroni says, will be there. I've had a bishop saying, hey, I'll see you there. And uh, Christ is going to be there. How am I going to pick him out? And um, the exception is he has learned to magnify himself. So with my eye, I can see people. With his eye, he can see into the heart of man and know who we are, really. With, um, you know, if I wanted somebody to remember me forever, you know, I'd scream, I'd shout, you know, you'd never forget me, I'd grab your ear, I'd, you know. But, um, you know, with his still, small voice, the voice of perfect mildness, can cause your heart to burn, your being to shake. I mean, it's, I can't, I can't do that. So um, I learned about his nature. I learned what, I found that he was merciful. Uh, two to one basis compared to judgmental. Uh, he can show forth goodness, um, mercy, tender, tender mercies, kindness, patience, all, all the traits I can show forth on a good day. You know, he, he has those. It, it's like he, he's given to man those same traits. But uh, mine are more spontaneous and not necessarily connected to something. And then he can show forth wrath, fiery ind indignation. I'm not sure I felt that. Fullness of his wrath. And uh, I know anger. I'm just not sure I know wrath. But uh, I then found that each time one of those characteristics is shown forth in the Book of Mormon, it is because of man's actions. So keep the commandments, mercy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Attend to your prayers, <laughs> you know, kindness, patience, uh, you know, long suffering. Uh, and so um, what I found was, let's say that you wanted mercy, but instead you wanted his exceeding mercy, the multitude of his tender mercies. It, uh, it was given to the people in the Book of Mormon who kept the commandments with exact obedience. So there was a gradation. How do you get, um, you know, his wrath? Uh, Alma says, oh, wish I that I could be banished. <laughs> he just said wrath. He had no idea what fullness of the wrath or or others. And uh, the answer is, how do you get that? And it is you rebel. But let's say you really want fiery indignation. You willfully rebel. So it's not that you just 
don't keep the commandments, but you angrily, you, you rebel against the Lord. The next time I read the Book of Mormon, I wanted to see what I could learn about what was the main theme of Christ in the Book of Mormon. I found 39 times it said he was coming. I found his mother's name mentioned a couple of times, it was Mary. There was talk about John the Baptist, about him choosing 12, about uh, healing the sick, about his death, about his resurrection. But the main theme, by far, 101 times, just like the names, was atonement. So you can read the New Testament. You get a couple of verses about the atonement. You read the Book of Mormon. The theme of Christ is the atonement. So the question is, uh, what are we going to do with all this information? I graffitied my book. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to tell everybody. I wanted to be like Alma and just tell everybody it, it's true. Uh, you know, dust it off. Don't, don't just keep it closed. I, I think the worst invention we ever made was scripture bags. You know, uh, you know, we just zip them up and we carry them to church and open them up and then zip them back up, throw them uh, somewhere in the bedroom, and then the next Sunday say, where, where is that bag? And off we go. Uh, don't, don't miss out. Find, uh, find Christ in the Book of Mormon. And uh, when you do so, in so many ways, you'll find yourself. Uh, you can imagine, uh, once you're pretty interested in one scripture, you want to turn to the other. And uh, I, I have always loved the New Testament and uh, the Gospels that tell about Christ. And so uh, with that same pen in hand, I'm uh, trying to do the same thing with the New Testament. What I discovered was uh, as surprising as what I had found in the Book of Mormon. And it was that using the same kind of setup, uh, you know, every, every verse is a, you know, one sentence and kind of going forward. And then um, word count. And uh, as I went forward, remember I'm not having a computer. I, I still hope all of that is accurate today. I know it made a difference for me. but. Uh, I found in the New Testament, every 2.1 verses mention Christ's name compared to every 1.7 in the Book of Mormon. So if you were to look, you'd say, well, you can obviously find more parables in, uh, in the New Testament. You can find, uh, you know, stories of his healing people and so forth. But if you're looking for just name count, where it, which is the more powerful? witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, don't forget the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is absolutely a miracle. Uh, it's a miracle because you look at young Joseph Smith in his 20s, has never written a book in his life, and suddenly he's called by the Lord to be a translator. You can look at Moroni, uh, and then you take the Book of Mormon, and any way you look at it, if you're looking for chiasmus, you got it. If you're looking for doctrine, it's all over the place. But if you're looking for Christ, uh, you're going to find that. And it's there in neon lights. You just got to search. <laughs>